Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of ver verisimilitude, or as John Campy likes to call me, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, with a mailbag for Monday, June 20th, 2022. And remember, if you watch our show, and why don't you? You should watch our show every morning. We open up the show to Super Chats so we can answer them all there live while you shoot them in but if you have a question or a comment or a review or just your inner monologue that you would like to share with us you can go to that link right down below to our mailbag and we have our operators working tirelessly for you 24 7 7 days a week we'll accept those tips and if we deem your comment appropriate we will read it right here on the mailbag and to show you examples of those let's begin shall we uh hero guys one of four Hero Guy says, I am an Indian Muslim and I've thoroughly enjoyed Miss Marvel. Aside from it being fun, entertaining show with great characters, I'm happy to see their portrayal of Islamic culture. It's not for everyone, but for me, it's accurate and tastefully done. I have friends and family who are exactly like the characters on the show. Aunties gossiping uh, at, at id festivities, Board drama, stolen shoes, even someone giving me an alcoholic drink knowing I don't drink. They're all experiences I and my friends have had. The show feels organic, not overdone. It's even more nuanced than I expected. There are a few quick references to surveillance of Muslim communities, British colonialism, and how selective history is taught. All things I've discussed with my friends. For me, Miss Marvel isn't preachy or denigrating. It just highlights the religion and culture that I and others grew up with. I'm really appreciative of that. Thank you to the show creators and to Marvel for giving them the opportunity to make this show. Well, Hero Guy, um, you know, you just you just laid out something. Another friend of mine who was a Pakistani Muslim told me about the show. And to me, that's really what makes the show exciting. And I think it's something that, you know, you cannot forget. And people need to understand it's this kind of representation that I think that's the most important in entertainment, where you show cultures like I, of course, I was raised a Jew. I was adopted into a Jewish family, raised a Jew. I've never been a Muslim. So if I can watch a show where I can see a Muslim representation and genuine, authentic representation of a Muslim family, and I hear from someone like yourself, Hero, I love that because one of the great things about this kind of entertainment is this is the most palatable way we learn about other people's cultures. You know, you put something, it's why I love great science fiction. You know, great science fiction shows you different places, different things, whether it's an alien world or something, you can delve into things in the context of science fiction, fantasy, horror, adventure. It makes it palatable to the masses. And in the case of a uh, a superhero show about a emerging female superhero who's in her teenage years and and seeing an accurate representation of her Muslim family, I love that, and I think that's what great storytelling does. That's why you know we were talking earlier on the John Campy show today about the portrayal of a Korean family in Kim's Convenience, you know, or the portrayal of other families within the context of shows. Um, you know, I learned about how wacky Canadians are through Letter Kenny. Um, or John Campy himself. And I think that's important. And um, I love to hear that this representation in this show is being done well. And to hear it from you, Hero, um, that's that's why this show is, I think, a great show. And it's not getting its due because I don't think a lot of people understand that. But it's great to hear from you. Bradley sends in a tip. Oh, here it comes again. A lot of people have been telling me that I do not understand the end of Lost. Rob, I think you misunderstood the end of Lost. They weren't dead the whole time, and the island wasn't purgatory. The flash sideways were where they met after they died naturally, long after the island, before moving on together. Everything on the island happened. Well, that's one interpretation. I mean, maybe so. Um, I, I, I would posit this. The problem that I have with Lost is that the from the very beginning, from the very first episode, from the pilot, the show asks a question. What is this island? They never answer that question. I mean, you can make up any answer you want, but they never definitively said, what is the island? That's all I wanted to know. What is it? It's a lot of things to a lot of different people, 
But what is it? Why is it there? Where did it come from? What's the point? And they never answered that question because they would prefer to leave it ambiguous. But they asked that question from the first episode. And for six years, I watched that show, did not get an answer because they never wanted to answer that question because they didn't know what the answer was. So to me, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> Captain Dr. Hawkeye Pierce. Regardless of whether or not you like the content, you cannot deny that Lucasfilm has and continues to be some of the most revolutionary technological innovators of and for the entire industry. Hashtag stay sweaty. I don't. I don't deny that. I mean, ILM was always on the cutting edge of effects technology, but I would say this, uh, you know, and obviously their, their volume stages and stagecraft has been amazing, but, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily, technology is one thing. It's how you employ technology that's really important. And while I think that their stagecraft, te stagecraft technology, the volume stages, have allowed them to do a lot more than they could on normal TV budgets, that's well and good. But if it's not in the service of great storytelling, it's just technology. Technology is just a tool. At the end of the day, it's storytelling that reigns supreme. I mean, I could tell you a great story in an empty room with two characters, a, two chairs, and cameras, if that's all I had. Even though it's a little more than that, witness a Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode called Duet and tell me you needed a lot of technology to make a compelling hour of science fiction television because you don't. And um, I think it really depends. No doubt that Lucasfilm has, in fact, been pushing the envelope technologically. But are we getting the stories that we deserve? That's a different question. Uh, DS21 says, hey, guys. Eagle Eye nitpick for Obi-Wan Episode 5, but during the training scene, Obi-Wan has his lightsaber from the Phantom Menace. Don't the production team pay attention to detail, laugh out loud? I've heard people bring this up. I don't know necessarily if that's true or not, um, because if that is, I would say that was a production mistake, because shouldn't he, isn't that uh, Attack of the Clones era? But then again, I'm not necessarily up on my lightsabers the way I am with my phasers, so I couldn't I couldn't answer that question definitively, but you're not the first person to bring it up. So I, I choose to go with you. I think that might be a mistake. Big Will says, hey, John and crew. So both of author Michael Connolly's shows, Bosch Legacy and The Lincoln Lawyer, got renewed for season two. I love these shows. The percentage on Rotten Tomatoes have been amazing. So what is your take and where would you like to see them go next? Well, you know what? Harry Bosch and The Lincoln Lawyer, they team up later in Michael Connolly's books. Um, I'd love to see a crossover. I love Titus Welliger's Titus Welliger, Titus Welliver as Bosch. And I don't remember the new guy who's playing The Lincoln Lawyer, but I think he's great. Uh, it's a little different take on The Lincoln Lawyer, but I think the shows are, are really, really good. I've watched the first three episodes of Lincoln Lawyer, and I'm really enjoying it. I've loved Titus Welliver's Bosch. I've really enjoyed the various seasons of Bosch, and I'm a fan of, of Michael Connolly's work. So I think this is great. It's great to see that um, this shows is these shows are going on, and hopefully they'll do a big crossover miniseries. I think that'd be great. I'm glad you're digging the shows. Stephen Stanley sends in a tip and says, what are your thoughts on Taika Waititi's comments on wanting to expand the Star Wars universe in his movie? It's definitely something I've been waiting to hear. Stephen? You and I both. I mean, my God, why is it? I think the smallest universe in the world is the Star Wars universe. There's so much going on, so many things happening. I would love to see um, a show, you know, any show that has nothing to do with the Skywalker saga. There's so many different kinds of shows you could do in the Star Wars universe. And I, I think Taika Waititi is going to give us a whole new, different take on all this, we're going to see something we've never seen before, and I'm there for it. I think this is long overdue in the Star Wars universe, and give it to a great filmmaker like him, we're going to get something we've never had before, which I love. So you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. Jose Hernandez says, I saw an early screening of Black Phone, and it was creepy and great. Uh, we did too. And I think that I speak for all of us, in particular, I speak for Ray Ora, right, Ray? Right. When I say how great 
black phone is. A lot of fun. To me, that's the way I think that um, that's the way you do low-budget horror. And the, the, the team, the writing, directing team, Robert Cargill and Scott Derrickson, who gave us Doctor Strange, you know, they can shift gears, go back and do a great low-budget horror film and knock it out of the park. That's the way filmmakers should work. Kudos to them. Mr. Hernandez, you and I, we also like the same stuff, so I'm glad you dug it because it was I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Deadpool's <laughs> Deadpool's Unicorn says, Great job, Chris and Rob. You are killing it. I just saw recently that Rob has a short called Elizabeth that he directed. One, is the name just ironic? And two, I couldn't find it anywhere, any idea where I can watch it. Well, I'll tell you something. It's funny that you say that. It has. It, I, I made it way before the, I knew Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell. And a friend of mine um, had written a short to showcase her acting ability. And so I did it for them. And I, you know, we shot it. It was great. We shot it with these, these 50s anamorphic lenses. And I thought it ended up turning out great. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I don't have a copy of it. I would love to, I should find out and ask uh, the woman I made it for if if it's available to get anywhere else. I would love to see if if it exists. It was a lot of fun. We did two shorts for them. And um, I, I, I really had fun doing it. It was a great time. But again, I, I don't know where it is, but it has nothing to do with Elizabeth. I mean, my Elizabeth. <laughs> Not that she's my Elizabeth. I don't, I have no ownership over her, but the lady in my life, the love of my life, Elizabeth. She is not the subject of this video. But it's a good question. Like Chris, I'm a casual Star Wars fan. This is also Deadpool's unicorn again. Like Chris, I'm a casual Star Wars fan, so I'm all for Easter eggs for diehard fans, but main plot points, like the two stomach thing, is how he survived. Shouldn't be something we should just know without y'all's show, and that would have been lost on me. Look, Deadpool's unicorn, I'm with you. Um, you know, it's one thing to rely on Easter eggs or the knowledge of another show, but I mean, give me a, give me a, a pithy quip about thanks, you know, say something about thanks. I have two stomachs. Otherwise I wouldn't be here again or something like that. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think star Wars has also, especially since force awakens has been rather egregious in assuming that there are audiences are reading the novels and know all the lore and have Steve Sansweet's Star Wars encyclopedias. I mean, it's it's I I I think that it needs to it, that it needs it's not fair to your audience to do that. When the Grand Inquisitor comes back, the first thing a less knowledgeable person would know who doesn't know all the lore or see all the animated shows is going to be like, wait a minute, I just saw that guy get skewered, and if that guy got skewered and can come back. I guess that means that Reva gets skewered and comes back. What? What? Are, does anyone die in the Star Wars universe anymore? I mean, Darth Maul got cut in half and he came back. So if someone gets skewered by a lightsaber or cut in half, I guess it really doesn't matter because they're just going to go get fixed. So I'm right there with you. I, I think Star Wars has become over-reliant on that and they need to explain it better. So Deadpool's Unicorn, you go right on wondering what the hell is going on. I'm right there with you. Uh, Garden Variety Vagabond says, Rob, I'm let down that you referenced Twin Peaks Coffee and Laura Palmer rather than the more appropriate association with Cherry Pie and Diane. I actually own the original Diane, the Twin Peaks tapes of Agent Cooper audio cassettes. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I wasn't talking to Diane. I was making references about the show. If I was more in-universe... I might talk to Diane about my damn fine cup of coffee or uh or the the pie at at you know everyone's favorite diner. Um I could do that. I just didn't, you know, it's it's more of a meta overarching reference, but you know, I can't not every deep cut reference to a TV show from 1990 or the remake uh or not the remake, the third season, Twin Peaks the Return. I can't do it all all the time, but I try. I try. Uh, the sock says, if Anakin hadn't survived Mustafar, what was the Emperor's plan? Vader did most of the heavy lifting Jedi related because the Inquisitors were not nearly as effective. Would he have had to just train someone else or did he have someone in mind? That's a good question, the sock. Um, you know, in my mind, I think that the, the, the Emperor 
as a Sith Lord, he kind of utilizes the chaos that the universe is throwing at him. I think in a way, the Emperor is kind of like the Joker. He kind of winds things up and sees where they where they go. And he might have plans, but I think part of chaos and part of the unknown is part of his plan. It's the unpredictability of all these things that he's counting on, if that makes any sense. I think that he always has in his back pocket who's going to be the next Sith apprentice. I mean, I can't, I can't back that up, but I think that's probably part of what the dark side is. It embraces that chaos. It supports that chaos. It promotes that chaos. Whereas the Jedi think they're going to try and, ah, we're going to balance the force. We're going to bring order to the galaxy. Although the Sith believe in bringing order through chaos. At least that's what I tend to believe. So I don't know if he had a plan. I don't know. Um, but you know what? Obi-Wan Kenobi, make no mistake, and Vader even says it in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, he says, you made me. So in addition to failing as a Jedi and failing as a master that was teaching his Padawan, it was Obi-Wan Kenobi himself that forged Vader by taking the high ground and defeating him and leaving him for dead. Obi-Wan failed three times. Pretty bad. But that's what the Sith's all about. What? Well, hey, let's see what's going to happen. Because if Anakin didn't survive Mustafar, then, you know, the Emperor will find someone else who will. It's a good question, though. Uh, Shane Roxas says, hey, guys, I'm on episode one, I'm on season one, episode five of For All Mankind, and I am loving it. However, in the first minute of this episode, they straight up stole Hans Zimmer's score for Man of Steel. Forgot what I was watching for a second, but I love this show. Shane, not stolen. It's an homage. It's an homage. Um well, I'm glad you're loving it. I think it's one of the great shows on TV. It's one of the smartest shows on TV. And um, I really do believe that it is, like the original Star Trek itself, it is a celebration of human endeavor. And ultimately, it's positive showing that what mankind is capable of when we put our heads together and truly cooperate. I find the show to be very inspiring and uplifting on every level. Isn't that right, Ray? Yep. He says... Ray agrees. So I'm glad you've discovered it. And I think, look, season three just started. You're going to love season two. Season two's ending had one of the best hours of television I've seen in 20 years. Oh, my God. And season three, first two episodes have started strong, and they've set up a really interesting new conflict. So I'm very uh, excited. Mike G says, let's give it up for Tim Sale, artist of The Long Halloween for all seasons, dark victory, when in Rome, etc. He recently passed. A true artist. He's smiling at us through the six panel grids. Love and respect. I was a huge fan of Tim Sale. Actually, I still am. It didn't get my fandom. It didn't go anywhere. As I've said on the show, uh, I, I self publish a comic book, and Tim Sale did the cover for the fourth issue. Uh, he was an amazing artist. He really elevated the art of comic books, and he will absolutely be missed. And for all seasons, man, what a great comic that is. Um, yeah, I mean, what can you say? You know, it just reiterates that you you got you to gotta keep moving forward in your life and trying to accomplish as much as you can and do what you want and, and really, really go after your dreams because you don't know how long you're going to be here for. And um, Tim Sale was somebody who proved that. So rest in peace, Tim. Moon Knight Questions. My favorite questions. So did they ever clarify who asked the girl out, Mark or Jake? Not really. Uh, why did Mark look up at the security camera after fighting the wolf? Was it really Jake in control fighting Harrow's goons in that village with his hand all bloody instead of Mark? Well, Moon Knight questions, I think, I think we're supposed to assume at the end that here's my problem. And here's what I don't get. Obviously, as a lifelong Moon Knight fan, Originally, Stephen Grant and Jake Lockley and Mark Spector. Mark Spector was the real guy. Stephen Grant was a persona he took on, and so was Jake Lockley. Uh, Mark Spector set himself up as millionaire playboy Stephen Grant to live in New York and to be like Bruce Wayne but move in certain circles, and that Jake Lockley was a cab driver. I mean, that's how he was. That's how Moon Knight was created, and 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 Jake he, Moon Knight would go out, Mark would go out as Jake Lockley, Ear to, ear to the, the streets, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. 
And um, that's what Moon Knight was all about. So it 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 was a little weird with all the dissociative identity disorder. That's something they added very well, relatively late to the Moon Knight canon in the last 10 years, even though Moon Knight's been around since 1975. So I can't really answer these questions. I don't think the show did a great job, but judging by the end of the series, I would say that Jake did some of that heavy lifting, and it's probably good to assume that probably he did ask the girl out because that's something Jake would do. But again, it's not definitive. I think it's still ambiguous. And to be honest, overall, the Moon Knight series started strong for me, but it ended, it was kind of a letdown, to be honest. And I still, you know, in a Moon Knight show, you've got giant Egyptians, Egyptian gods fighting each other over the Great Pyramids and eating people's souls. And again, what does it have to do with Moon Knight? You know, I mean, they've made Khonshu a player in the comics, the Marvel comics, but when Moon Knight was first conceived, it wasn't like that. So these questions are good questions, and you have to continue to ask them. Hopefully, we will get a season two. Existential Mr. Rogers. Yo, you mean I'm talking to myself? Is that what I, I didn't send this in? A Daredevil versus the boys. Through both two seasons and four episodes of each series and both being completely different, which series is best? I love the boys, but season two of Daredevil was almost superior. Thanks for bringing on the filthy. Well, existential Mr. Rogers, I have to say, um, in a way, it's kind of, even though they're both superhero shows, you're dealing with sort of apples and oranges. I think that... The Boys is a great skewering of modern culture across many different areas, whether it's everything from corporate culture to social media to to superheroes themselves, whereas Daredevil is pretty strictly a superhero show. And, and I would say for me, I think Daredevil was a great show about Daredevil himself. Like, I can't imagine a better show, a better TV show, a better series than Daredevil was. I mean, you can have a nitpick here and there, but truly it's a really great Daredevil show. I think The Boys has a lot more on its mind. So if I want to see a satisfying superhero show or a great adaptation of a of a character, I look to Daredevil. But The Boys is, and some people disagree with us, but I think The Boys is a better TV show than it is a comic because it reveled, the, the comic reveled in pushing the envelope in terms of sexuality and, and violence and all that. But I do think that the series itself, the TV show itself, it, it's skewering a lot of sacred cows and at the same time offering some really interesting social commentary. And I, I would give the edge to the boys, but I don't want to say, I don't want to uh, say anything uh, that, that uh, to detract from Daredevil because what they were trying to do, I think they accomplished uh, with flying colors. I just think the boys is trying to do something different, and I think they both succeeded. I just prefer one over the other, but I do love both shows, if that makes any sense. Duke of Dope Discourse sends in a tip and says, Wonder Man's origins are connected to Stark Industries. How do you think they'll bring him into the MCU? Maybe connect him to Stark's rival, Justin Hammer? Plus, how do they tone down his power level? He is, of course, one of Marvel's most powerful characters. Um, you know, Duke, that's a really interesting observation. I mean, they have to depower him. The same way the vision, I think, in, in, in the MCU has been depowered. Because the vision is incredibly powerful. They've played that down. Um, they have to make Wonder Man more of a man. But yeah, he is one of the the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. And how if... I mean, look, they've changed Miss Marvel's powers. I think they're not beyond going back and re... Um, sort of reimagining these characters. They keep the traits they need and then they, they, they take away the traits that'll... I mean, if Wonder Man wasn't believable then he wouldn't work. They have to make him believable within the context of how the MCU is now. I mean, it would be interesting to see him come out of Stark Industries, but I like your idea of using Justin Hammer. I mean, we've talked about this before on the show. I would love to see them bring Justin Hammer back as much more of a um, much more of a, an effective villain. I could see that happening, but Wonder Man deriving his powers or having a connection to Justin Hammer, uh, I, I like that. I think I like where you're going with that. I don't know if that's what they're going to do, It'll be interesting to see where they go with that and how that Wonder Man storyline emerges, but 
works for me, man. I like your ideas. Mojito fan says, hi, gang. Reading about Ezra Miller, they don't need to reshoot all the Flash. It's different versions of the Flash. They could just do a start off with Miller and then do what they did with the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Um, well, Mojito fan, that's a really interesting idea. Obviously, um, uh, Heath Ledger died when they were making the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, so they had other actors come in like Johnny Depp and play different versions of the character. That's a really interesting way to go. Um, Mojito fan, you've been, I bet you were drinking a lot of mojitos when you came up with this idea. It's a good idea, um, but again, it's still expensive, and then you have to hire more actors, and they're, all, they're probably going to want more money, and, and I, it, it's really a question of are you able to go back in and reshoot this and make it work? It's incredibly difficult to do so. I don't know if they will, especially, look, the real sad part is if, if if the movie's great, I think when you're watching it, I, I when I watch movies, I don't I don't think about what these people did in real life. A great movie transports you away and allows you, I think, to watch it. I don't know if this movie will, but I do think that what you've proposed is a very interesting idea. I like the idea. I don't know if they would go for it. And because, again, but it is a Flashpoint movie, maybe there's something there. It'll be really interesting to see how Warner Brothers deals with this. But pulling an Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus on it, not a bad idea. Probably the best idea I've heard. Because it's a Flashpoint movie, you could do that and get away with it. Nero Strike sends in a tip and says, Greetings. I thought about Reva's characterization and why she hasn't measured up to John's liking. She's a grown woman having to channel her inner child due to the trauma she's endured, which has stunted her growth. In essence, she's a child actor. Mm, Neurostrike, that's an interesting observation. I Here's my problem. Doing what she does, being an inquisitor, I mean, life's tough. Life is a hard thing to get through. The universe is indifferent to your suffering. And she made a choice that she was going down this pathway to become an inquisitor to try and kill Vader. She's made a choice to kill innocent people. She's made a choice to track down force sensitives of which she is one. She's using the force to subjugate people. She's, she's using the dark side. You know, she chose her path. I don't think she's a child. I think you don't do what she does and you're essentially your inner child. You, you've lost your innocence long ago. And uh, I blame her for her actions. She has brought her fate to her doorstep, and she must accept it. Um, I don't. We can't absolve her of her sins. Yeah, she had a bitch of a childhood. I mean, it sucked being in that Jedi temple to be a youngling, see your friends and essentially family slaughtered, watch a Jedi do it. Not good. I I sympathize, but you know what? Boo hoo. We've had lots of people who have had horrible trauma in their young life. Look what happened to Europe during World War II. How many people lost their families? How many families were torn asunder? You just got to suck it up, man. But she became an inquisitor. She decided it was her own agency to do what she, she – she wanted to kill Vader. She did what she had to do. So she's responsible for her own actions, I think. Not a kid. Not a kid. Andy says, hey, Rob, I saw your tweet asking about sci-fi novels early this year. Let's ask about sci-fi novels. Early this year, I read Childhood's End and loved it. That's Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End. Fantastic book. Little depressing, a little, but I, it, it'll definitely leave you pondering what your life is all about when you get to the end of Childhood's End. A great book. Would love to hear Rob thoughts thoughts if he's read it. Yes, I have. And please recommend some classic sci-fi novel other than Dune and Rendezvous with Rama that held up well. Yeah, lots of people read Dune and Rendezvous with Rama. Well, first of all, there's a, there's a lot of great books. First of all, Childhood's End, I really, for those of you who don't know, Childhood's End, and there is a miniseries, but it's not so great, is about these aliens, the overlords, that basically come to Earth to assist humanity to move on to the next stage of evolution. And uh, the current generation, the, the older generation that's on Earth, is not going to evolve. So we basically only have about 50 years left before these aliens help the younger generation and, and people that are born 
move on to the next plane of, of, of existence. And it is melancholy and sad, but it's a fascinating book. I really, really, really liked it. Um, if you like that, uh, he wrote another book called Imperial Earth that I really loved when I was a kid. Also, of course, he wrote 2001, and 2001 and 2010 are worth reading. Then he also wrote two other 2000 books. He wrote 2061 and 3001, The Final Odyssey. Um, other great science fiction books uh, that I like are by Peter F. Hamilton. He writes giant, sprawling space opera books that are great. And um, I'm in the middle of his Salvation trilogy. I'm in the middle of his second Salvation book. I always recommend Dan Simmons' uh, Hyperion Cantos, or at least Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion. They were written as one book, but the publisher did want to publish a 900-page book, so they split the book into two, into Hyperion, Fall of Hyperion. But get those, read those. Those are great. Stephen Baxter is a favorite author of mine, and his Manifold trilogy is really good. Manifold Space, Manifold Time, and Manifold Origin. I didn't dig Manifold Origin so much. You don't have to read it, but uh, Manifold Space and Manifold Time, highly recommended. There's a pretty dense science fiction book that I recommend to people that was nominated for the Hugo Award by a guy named Peter Watts called Blind Sight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty thick read. But I love this book. I love Blind Sight. Um, uh, Charles Strauss, Accelerando is a great book. If you have never read um, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, if you like Ready Player One, Ready Player One's like an elementary school story. Snow Crash is college. Get Snow Crash. If you don't like the first page, I'll give you your money back. It's so good. It's the most entertaining book I think I've ever read. It's got some very heady subject matter in it. So those are just a few off the top of my head uh, to give you. If you want to read a really interesting book about uh, gender, read Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. That's uh, that's another great book. Um, yeah, so check those out. Guys, we want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. You know the one with the delightful ads with good Canadian kid Ryan Reynolds? So look, after years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, is that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just $15 a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't a catch. And guys, that's no joke because for years I've been using one of the major providers and it was fine. But I switched over to Mint Mobile a little while ago. The service has been fantastic. And the big difference is I'm now paying about one third of what I was paying before. And the best part for anybody who just hates their phone bills is that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Thanks for asking. Ethan Holgate, one of three. Uh, hi, Chris, Rob, or John. I've not been the biggest fan of the Jurassic World movies. I think the first two are watchable and enjoyably decent, but not as good as the original trilogy, in my opinion, so I haven't been super excited to see Dominion. I saw it today after the first week of it being out, and now I understand why your friend was so mad about this movie, Rob. Laugh out loud. I didn't hate the movie, but I found it incredibly boring and forgettable. I mean, like, how can you make a movie with dinosaurs in it so freaking boring? I just don't know. The movie is well made and has great effects, but that means nothing without an engaging story, in my opinion. The original cast, I thought, was the best part of the movie, but everything else was just lifeless. No heart and just a snooze fest. Well, Mr. Holgate, Ethan, my friend, uh, I think that you have nailed... The most important thing about a story, a great story, whether you're a viewer or a reader, a great story always poses a question or 
something at the beginning of the story, whether it's about the protagonist itself, whether it's about the, the, the actual premise of the story, and it poses a question, and you as a viewer or a reader want to know, well, what's the answer? What is the answer to that question? And hopefully a great story will take you on a journey and it will answer the question that is posed by that initial impulse at the beginning of the story. That's one of the reasons I didn't like Lost. The question that it posed, what is this island, was never really answered, at least satisfactorily to me. And I think Jurassic World, and by the way, just let me just say it, I haven't seen Dominion. And I, to be honest, people's reactions to it, like yours, make me reluctant to even want to go because even the trailers, I thought the trailers, I was affected by them emotionally. All I know about the movie is that Blue had a baby. Some people come and they take the baby and they have to go back and get Blue. My question, if I'd made Jurassic World Dominion, is what happens when a 65 million year old species that went extinct becomes the dominant life form on planet earth more so than us hence the word dominion in the title what happens and apparently the movie's not about that and i, I think to myself well that's lame sauce i mean i i want to know how how would human life change if suddenly there's tyrannosaurus rexes running around malta you know how would that happen or what would what, what would that do to us as people how would we reconcile humanity moving forward i don't know but i would like that to have been addressed and people have told me that they don't get into that it's i mean that's that might sound to you a little boring and academic but you know what happens when the outside like when you walk out into nature and you, you smell the flowers what happens if you can't anymore because a raptor will come and take your head off if you're not careful what does that do to us i mean i think it'd be kind of cool um but i think that's the problem it told a story it didn't ask a very good question in the first place, and the story that it told wasn't that interesting. And that's kind of a bummer. So I feel your pain. Marie Seifring, $20 tip. Marie, thank you. Thank you for that generous uh, support of this channel. Hey, crew, you're doing a great job. I hope John feels better soon. Well, as you saw, he's back on the show today, so welcome back, John. Austin Butler seems to have done a nice job as the lead in the Elvis movie. It is exciting to read that he will play he will play Fade Ralpha in the next installment of the Dune saga. Is he the next big star? Marie, great question. I have to say I've been watching a lot. He's been doing a lot of appearances on talk shows. And I just watched, believe it or not, I watched um, a clip this morning. I don't know where it was from, but it was, it was an interview on stage with, I want to say it was AT and T, but it wasn't. Uh, with Baz Luhrmann and Austin Butler and Tom Hanks and the woman who plays Priscilla Presley, they were on stage, and Austin Butler tells the story of how he knew he got the job. And that guy, he's got star written all over him. He's charismatic. He's brooding. Apparently, he's great in Elvis. I think we are going to watch a supernova happen with him. Uh, in the clips we've seen, he looks amazing. He seems to definitely be movie star material. So I do think that he is going to be a big star. I really do. So, Marie, that's a great question. And I think, look, we're all going to find out when we see the movie. Proof is in the pudding. And I think Austin Butler definitely has that, that quality. And I want to thank you for supporting the channel. And you know what? Go see Elvis. Right back and tell us what you think, because I'm very curious to see what people think of this movie and Austin Butler's performance. Um, it's funny because he doesn't look like Elvis Presley, but there's something about him that reminds me of Elvis Presley. And I think when he becomes Elvis, he's kind of got that thing, you know, that thing, that Elvis thing. I think he's got it. And I'm looking forward to it. Maybe that's the new hot toy that I'm going to have to bring in tomorrow. Bring in my Elvis. But thanks for writing in, Marie. Hitchcock is the goat, writes in and says, this may or may not be a bold prediction, but since I believe families will flock to Lightyear over Jurassic World Dominion this weekend, Top Gun Maverick will supplant Jurassic World and take the number two spot since word of mouth has given it great legs. Uh, you were close. You were close. Um, I don't know if it took the number two. Maybe it, no, it made 44. It took the th number three spot, but you're thinking, Hitchcock, absolutely correct um obviously it had the biggest fourth weekend of any of this yeah the the second biggest 
fourth weekend of any movie in history, or maybe it was the number one. I don't remember. Do you guys remember? Um, but yeah, it's amazing. Uh, they fantastic. The hold on that is incredible. But yeah, families flock back to Top Gun and to Jurassic World and to Lightyear. Not as many as they would have hoped, but your your reasoning was sound. So I definitely I'm with you there 100. percent You're you're not wrong. It just didn't edge out everything. Maverick did not get number two. It was number three, but just by a little because it made 44 million. Huge result for Top Gun. Old Tom Jin says, that's a good name. Old Tom Jin says, calling it now. The John Sh- the John Snow. The John Snow series is going to be a night watch procedural detective show with, <laughs> with John and, and a resurrected Ed solve crimes amongst the wildlings while complaining about everything. Homicide, life beyond the wall. <laughs> you know what, old Tom Jin? I would watch that show. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I think that we're going to get, you, you know, I think we're going to see how does Jon Snow be, truly become a king uh, with his new kingdom beyond the wall. I, I'm there for that. I think it's going to be really interesting. The problem is when you're beyond the wall and the White Walkers are gone, there's just you. I mean, the white wildlings, all those people have been decimated. So what's left? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. Or maybe Jon Snow comes back and the, the stories about how is he going to interact with his family anymore with the Unsullied out there? Or did they go to their island? How's that going to work? I don't know. But I really love Kit, Kit Harrington. I really love Jon Snow. I don't think it's going to be homicide life beyond the wall, but I, I like that idea. But a procedural, you know, how much crime can there be when he knows everybody? <laughs> but I like your idea. It's It's amusing. Uh, Wade Water sends in a tip and says, as I write this message, it looks like Lightyear is going to become a box office bomb and even fail to unseat Jurassic World Dominion on its opening weekend. Will Chapek dump Pixar's next film, Elemental, straight to Disney Plus next summer? Well, Wade Water, a good question. I, You know what? With, with animated films, I always like to wait and see because they traditionally play a little bit longer than other films because they have the family audience. Right now, there's a lot of weird controversy around the movie, and people are pointing fingers and all that. I think it's still a good movie, even though I've only seen a third of it. Uh, I, I would rather wait to see what happens in Weekend 2 and 3 and 4 to see if it's a true bomb. It was an expensive movie to make. It only made $51 uh, million. But remember, it's summer now. Kids are out of school. Parents are taking kids to kids' movies. Let's see where Lightyear is at the end of weekends two and three, because it might surprise us. You know, I don't know if it's going to be a billion dollar juggernaut, which it clearly is not going to be, but we'll see where it winds up. Right now it's underperforming, but I'm hesitant to call it a bomb just yet. Ethan Holgate says, hi guys, out of curiosity, I'm the only one who would watch an American Psycho remake starring Anthony Starr's Patrick Bateman. I know I'd want to see that. Obviously, that probably won't ever happen, and that movie doesn't need to be remade. It's just a fun thought. Man, you know what, Ethan? Uh, now I cannot unsee that. I I don't know if Anthony, Anthony Starr's grin, he's kind of got this rictus skeletal grin when he really does that Homelander thing. I don't know if he could play Patrick Bateman because remember, uh, Patrick Bateman was totally unhinged. Christian Bale was unhinged, but he could also be really understated. I don't know if Anthony Starr can be. I don't know if I could ever see Anthony Starr as being understated. But um, I like your idea. I think that Ethan, that uh, if if they had to remake American Psycho, which I hope they don't. By the way, I do own it on 4K uh, Blu-ray. I hope that. You know, that's not a bad idea. He might be too old, though, because I think Patrick Bateman has to be in his late 20s, I think. Um, but not a bad bit of casting. I like where you're thinking. I like where you're coming from. Jonathan uh, Namilas. Namila, Jonathan Namila is here, sends in a tip and says, Hey, John and Rob, I have a unique way to promote the Flash movie. Ezra Miller is really playing Clayface as the Flash in the Flash movie, and there are multiple Clayfaces acting as Flash to betray Batman. Clayface gets the upper hand, but Batman detective skills, bam, and bring on the filthy. Um, Jonathan, 
I like the fact that you're trying to figure out clever ways out of this conundrum Warner Brothers finds itself in. Just, just me, I just don't think this would work. Clayface, um, don't think it would work. I know where you're going, and I appreciate your interesting way to problem solve, but I just don't think this would work. So, however, you know what? Throw all those ideas out on the table. Who's to say what one won't stick? Maybe Clayface will. You never know. Uh, Jonathan Namella goes on to say, Hey, John and Rob. John, with your experiences as a film extra on big sets, what will movie extra roles be in the future with COVID procedures going on on set? Will extras be all CGI or will there be no extras or limited number of extras going forward? Bring on the filthy. Well, uh, I can answer that question. Look, I think as we are seeing in, it's really interesting, in Obi-Wan, there's a lot of CG stormtroopers. And it's easy to do that because you don't have to create human faces. But I think, yeah, with COVID protocols that lots of extras, look, extras are expensive anyway. And when they when they made uh, Lord of the Rings, they had the massive software when it was new where they could create lots of CG, independent acting CG characters. And I think we're going to see more and more of that as technology increases. There's going to be a lot of non-player uh, extras on on sets, like in video games. And I think COVID protocols are part of it. But yeah, the less people on set, the better off, uh, the better off everybody is. I think we're going to see more of that. But remember, having CG extras might be, I mean, from a cost standpoint, extras are still relatively cheap, and they might even be less than actually having. CG replacements so I could see I could see it going both ways but we're always going to need CG I mean we're always going to need real extras to appear in scenes like you know let's say you have a jury in a, in a courtroom drama you need real people to fill those jury seats when you cut to them pondering the case you can't do that with CG at least not yet um I think this is the same one. Oh, it is different. Okay. Jonathan DeMello says, hello, John and Rob. What is it like to be a movie extra on big sets in LA? What is your favorite extra part you got? John and Rob, do you still do movie extra work? What are all movies you have been extras in? How do you become a movie extra? Bring on the filthy. Well, here's the thing, Jonathan. I've been an extra in a few movies. I was an extra in a movie James Gunn wrote called The Specials. I played part of a NASA or a hazmat team. I think my favorite role as an extra in a movie, I was the NASA reporter Ross Campbell in Superman Returns. You can only see me on screen for a split second, but you can hear him. I have dialogue. Um, so that is like a featured player. A real extra is somebody that's just on set, and they move you around. You're part of crowd scenes. You're part of a courtroom scene. It's kind of boring, but being on set is a lot of fun to watch if you're interested in how movies get made. So um, I've been both that, an extra, and like I played an FBI agent in an episode of Femme Fatales. I didn't really have any speaking roles or anything like that. But that's really what, a, what an extra is. You're, you're literally an extra person. And you're in the background. I've been extras where I walk through a, a scene, you know, walk through. Uh, the, it's a city street. Like you can't film on a city street and just have random people walking through your scene. All of those people have to be hired. They all have to be, those are real extras. There's extras casting places that you go through. And their extras, they're governed by certain rules as well. So um, being an extra on a movie set is a lot of fun. And it's also really boring. So it really depends what kind of a movie you're on and, and what you get to do. So, yeah, it's good. Reamer Bulldog says, according to Deadline, it looks like Warner Brothers has finally fired Ezra Miller which is about damn time, and now they got to figure out how to release this movie because I don't know if I can see this movie knowing that Ezra Miller is the lead. Well, Reamer Bulldog, you're probably not the only one uh, who feels this way. Now, they just said, they haven't said they fired him because remember, the movie's already made, so they can't fire him off a movie that was already made. They might need him for ADR work. We don't know what the disposition of the movie is. There has been a source that said the studio will not move forward with Ezra Miller in the role of The Flash. So whether we're going to see that or not, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, they I can't imagine. 
I, I think Ezra Miller has taken a torch to his career and burned up any future he has in the film business. I really do. I don't understand it. I haven't seen anything like this before. He's now taunting the authorities after he's, I mean, she's 18, that girl who's with him, but I don't know what his deal is. Maybe he's gone off the deep end because of something that happened in his life. I have no idea. Um, look, for me personally, I'll still watch the movie because I can disassociate the art from the artist. And, you know, he, if the movie's good, at least he showed up to work and he didn't like hold up production. So there is that. But what he's doing now is, I think, beyond the pale. So I can understand it if you don't want to go see Ezra Miller in, as The Flash. I don't think you're alone. But if the movie does come out, think about all the other people that work so hard on the movie. So I want to see their work at least. Sam Fisher. Sam Fisher says, Rob, your gatekeeping tweet judging people's favorite sci-fi showed up in a see why we actually like new Star Trek Facebook group. I'm part of it, and I had to defend you and say you were joking. Oh, no, Sam. Make no mistake. I was not joking. I was having fun for the day, though. Look, I think in terms of being a gatekeeper, there are worse things to ask than to have people send you their favorite science fiction novels. Uh, and start a discussion. And to, to, to be fair, some people sent me, I mean, a lot of people sent me great lists of books. And a lot of people said to me, Rob, that was, that was a, I like what you did because now I've got a lot of new reading material. Look, my whole feeling is this. As everyone knows, I've always said, you should like what you like. Don't ever, 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 ever apologize for stuff that you like, ever. I like things that are demonstrably trash. I'll flat out and say it. I like movies that aren't good. I can't defend them. I just like them. Uh, I always, people are like, well, Rob, what is an example of that? There are two science fiction movies that come to mind. Life Force, Toby Hooper's Life Force, a.k.a. Space Vampires. In Life Force, a, a fully naked alien girl, but she looks like a human, beautiful, probably the greatest breasts that have ever appeared on screen, walks around London naked and steals the life force from people and then they become vampires and they steal the life force by the end of the movie half of london is wandering around they've turned into crazy zombies their life force is being shot up to a giant 50 mile long spaceship from Halley's comet i'm telling you this is some crazy ass shit it's not good i love it i love it someone could come and go rob why do you like that terrible film it's a terrible movie and i would say I wouldn't say it's terrible. I would say like there are certain things to really enjoy in it. Two things I can think of in particular, but this movie is a lot of fun. There's there's it's spaceships are in it, space vampires are in it. It's noted for Patrick Stewart's first on-screen kiss with another dude because the dude's actually a space vampire and kisses him and steals his life force. I know it sounds crazy. It's awesome. The more I talk about this movie, I bet you're gonna think to yourself, hmm. That sounds pretty good. It's not good, but I love it. So here's the thing. Don't let, gatekeeping assumes that I'm going to keep somebody away or somebody's going to keep somebody away from something. No one's going to keep you away from anything. Criticism isn't gatekeeping. Criticism is criticism. I never personally attack people for what they like. And I'll always say, look, never apologize for what you like. Like things fiercely. Love them always, and don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't watch. However, if somebody is critical of something that you like, that doesn't mean you should take it as a personal attack, and you should be able to decide whether or not that person's a super douche or not. Some people are critical, and they actually have good points to make. There have been people that have criticized things that I like that I'm actually like, hmm, I never thought of that before, but I don't let it, uh, I don't let it offend me. In this case, I actually stated, nope. I'm gatekeeping now. I'm gonna I'm gonna decide whether or not whether what you like is 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 worthy of me. As you know, it was a bit because you heard me say it on the John Campy show. Not a lot of other people did. You know what I noticed about that though? There were a lot of people that didn't notice me and have never followed me that saw my tweets and they piled on. Nobody is a better bully online than people that are anti bullying. So there you go but never apologize for what you like ever. Jonathan Namela goes on to say, hello, you know, I keep saying, is it, is it Namila or Namela? 
Namila or Namela. It's a great last name either way. Hello, John and Watt Rob. What movie do you wish got a sequel that needs it? Well, as I've said on the show before, I'd love to see Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now I'd call it Ferris Bueller's Year Off. Now that Top Gun Maverick's a huge hit, Ferris Bueller's Year Off and Riskier Business. Those are the two movies from the 80s I would like to see. But a movie that needs a sequel, um, those two are good. But, you know, I don't know. Does any movie need a sequel? Um, I don't know. I don't know what needs a sequel. Hard to say. Um I, I would actually like to see, it's not a great movie, but I want to see another Alien movie that really Scott directs. I want to see what happens to uh, David the Android after Alien Covenant. Big cliffhanger there. Does he kill all those people, and what does he do? Does he experiment on them? I don't know. So that's my idea. I want I want an Alien Covenant sequel uh, that would be a sequel to two movies I found very disappointed, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. So why would I want a sequel? See, I don't know. Two movies I, I think aren't very good. I still want to know what happens. What does that say about me? No clue. No idea. So, a sequel to Alien Covenant. I can't believe I just admitted that on the show. I've blown my credibility with everyone. But, it's a good question. Jonathan goes on to say, Hello, John and Rob. What are your guilty pleasure movies to watch? Mine are Josie and the Pussycats. How dare you? Josie and the Pussycats rules. Not a guilty pleasure. You fly that Josie and the Pussycats flag high and wide. That's a great movie. I love it. Uh, Aloha. Yeah, it's not good, but it's Cameron Crowe, so I'll watch it. Movie 43. You're right. That's total guilty pleasure. Resident Evil, all movies. I own the box set on Blu-ray. How bad can they be? X-Men 3. Good one. Okay, Batman and Robin. That is a true guilty pleasure. That movie's wretched, but God bless you, Jonathan for saying that that movie is a guilty pleasure. I love that you, all the Hulk Hogan movies, all right, good one. Uncharted, have you had a movie day with bad movies? It's so much fun. Uh, yeah, it's true, but you know what? I'll tell you what my favorite guilty pleasure movie is. My favorite, my favorite studio movie, The Specialist. Sylvester Stallone, uh, Eric Roberts, and Sharon Stone. I mean, this movie, it should be an A-list studio movie. It is ridiculous. It's got a great John Barry score. It's ridiculous. I'm ashamed that I'm going to say this, but I love The Specialist. Total guilty pleasure. I will defend it. Come at me, bruh. Judge me all you want. That's definitely Star Crash, of course. You've heard me say that before. The Specialist. I want a sequel to Alien Covenant and Prometheus. Um, those movies aren't good, even though I kind of like them. So... There you go. But your list, any list that has Batman and Robin on it, I salute you. Because, boy, is that movie bad. But if you want to go there, that's a great guilty pleasure. So thank you for that. By the way, Jonathan, thanks for all the support. Very much appreciate it. Josh Becker says, hi, John and Rob. Regarding Guardians 3, since Gamora now doesn't recognize Peter, how do you think their story will end? Will they somehow get back together romantically? Or do you think the team will go down different paths Josh, I think it's tragic romance. I think the fact that Gamora and Peter Quill did they they, they don't they I mean Peter Quill has this whole history now with Gamora. She doesn't remember who he is. She doesn't know who he is at all. Will they fall in love again with one another? I think not. I think that's too easy. Peter Quill will always love her, but I think it makes it interesting the the, the Gamora Peter Quill dynamic that if he has this unrequited love and she never even knows. I think that could be great. I love that idea. I hope it happens. So that's what I think is going to happen. But I could be wrong. You know? Lost Boys Girly. <laughs> Hi. News on the Lost Boys reboot has been so quiet since it first got announced in September 21. Do you think it will still get made? I know someone involved with the music said it was supposed to start filming in March, but that came and went. Lost Boys Girly, I will say this. They are releasing Lost Boys on 4K. And a lot of the time when they announce these 4K discs, they decide what they're going to, to remaster in 4K based on the fact that a newer version of it or a, a, a remake is coming out. And now I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is. All I'm saying is that there is a Lost Boys 4K disc on the way, which means potentially there could be a Lost Boys movie, a Lost Boys reboot. 
I could definitely see a Lost Boys movie being made now. I think it's ripe for a remake. There's an 80s movie. Of course, we got the the two direct-to-video movies, which are kind of lackluster, to be honest. I'd love to see a big, uh, big budget Lost Boys movie. I mean, there's a movie from the 80s you could remake and I think would do huge, huge business. It's a good question. I haven't heard anything about it other than about the disc. So maybe, maybe. Brent Ivey says, how crazy is it that starting Thursday, we will have Jurassic Park, Top Gun, Elvis, and Lightyear. Finally, it feels like movies are back in full force. What are your thoughts? I agree with you. I mean, I'll tell you. And of of two of the Elvis and Lightyear, I mean, Lightyear is essentially an original film, even though it's an it's an it's adjacent to a franchise. It's not really it's not really a Toy Story movie. It's kind of its own thing. It's weird. I don't know. What it's not a requel, it's not a prequel, it's not a sequel. It's a what? I don't know. We should all come up with a new a new word. What is Lightyear? Um, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. And Elvis is original. And then we've got two big franchise properties burning up the charts. So yeah, maybe movies are back. I think it's really good. I think it's exciting. People are going to the movies again, which is great. And that Elvis is opening. I hope Elvis does really, really well. Um, but you're right. Movies are back, baby. Pandemic be damned. People are going back to the theater. Uh, Pepper Jack Man says, It took David Zaslav weeks to fire Ezra Miller. If a Disney actor was on the run from the authorities, the Hollywood trades would be doing daily hit pieces on Chapek, dropping the ball in regards to the silence. Why no outrage over Zaslav? Double standard. Pepper Jack Man, I don't think so. Look, They've already made, as John pointed out today, they've already made the movie. Flash is in the can. So technically, uh, Ezra Miller is no longer on the clock. While he's in the movie and he has to, he's contractually obligated to do press, he doesn't work for Warner Brothers right now. He appeared in a Warner Bros. I think he should assume, I've always believed that until a movie comes out and you've done all the press, you are representing the film rightly or wrongly. He was paid a lot of money to do this. Uh, so I believe he should be, what he's doing is abhorrent. I, I, It's a slap in the face to everyone who worked on the film. But technically, he does not work for Warner Brothers. He's off the clock. So what is David Zaslav supposed to do? He's spent $200 million. They've got to finish their movie. That's what Warner Brothers does. They make movies. He has to finish. So he hasn't yet. They haven't made the movie yet. And Ezra Miller is doing all these shenanigans. I think it's wrong. I hate it. But remember, there is no double standard here. He's no longer on Warner Brothers' payroll, at least at the current at the time. If he has to do ADR and come back, maybe he will be. Um, but right now, he's off the clock. So I don't think it's a double standard. Uh, Deadpool's Unicorn says, The new Jurassic World trilogy reminds me of one of the last Star Wars trilogy. Starts off strong, but by the last film, it's clear they had no plan, didn't pay off what was set up, and too many plot contrivances and ended on a down note, in my opinion. Look, man, from what I hear, I understand. And to me, I don't understand. Here's what I don't get, to be honest. Now, I understand the Lord of the Rings trilogy is based on a series of novels with a strong beginning, a middle, and an end. It is a good bet now in our franchise world I would not, if I was a studio executive and I had a Jurassic Park franchise and it was already a huge franchise, I would never embark on franchise filmmaking without a plan. It's hard enough coming out with a, coming up with a good script, but at least come up with outlines for a story. Like they do in television now. They come up with a complete season outline and they work to that. I don't understand why that's not done because ultimately you leave an audience dissatisfied. And look, say what you want. The proof is in the pudding. I mean, Star Wars The Force Awakens, yes, it was a fluke. Star Wars comes back. It made $2 billion at the box office. But the fact that Rise of Skywalker barely eked out a billion, you've dropped your earnings by 50%. That's a steep, that's a precipitous drop. Somebody somebody effed up. And, and I think that that's a perfect example of what you don't want to have happen to your franchise. That's why I agree with you. You need to, I think, you need to pre-plan this stuff. That's the only way you can do it. you got to pre-plan this stuff so you don't wind up with egg on your face or no money in your bank account. 
And that's what happened. That's what's happening, I think, with this movie, too. By the way, they're still going to be making out like bandits, but this is going to be a Rise of Skywalker version compared to Jurassic World Dominion. I think Dominion made 1.5 million, pardon me, 1.5 billion. I don't think this is going to come anywhere near that. And it should. This should be incredible. But what are you going to do? Deadpool's Unicorn goes on to say, as a casual Star Wars fan, seen everything TV and movie wise, has recent. Um, has recent media nerfed the lightsaber or is my nostalgia just strong here? Oh, nerf the light, like ruin the, uh, do you mean by, is that what that means? Ner if you nerf something, you ruin it? You downgrade it. You, downgrade it. you nerf, like a nerf gun. Yeah. Got it. I understand. Yeah, I think so. I think they've nerfed a lot of Star Wars. Look, the lightsaber is one of the coolest weapons that's ever been put on film ever. And I think that they've made it less cool. Um, and that's a bummer. They made it a little more casual and I don't like that. I think you're absolutely right. They have nerfed. I didn't realize that that's what that meant. I'm going to start using that all the time. Like if something's like overpowered, like in a video game, the developers will nerf it. So it, it to, yeah. Know. So it's just a nerf. And if something yeah. is uh weak and to even it up, they'll buff a weapon. Oh, so, so buff you, is the opposite of you nerf. buff it or nerf it. Those are gaming gaming terms. My old ass is not familiar with. I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna buff and nerf half my life. Then, okay, that's I love hearing that. But you're absolutely right. They have nerfed the lightsaber, and I don't like that. It's an elegant weapon from a more civilized time. That's what I say. Um. So yeah, I don't think I don't think that your nostalgia, uh, uh, Deadpool. Deadpool's Unicorn. I don't think your nostalgia is strong there. They've nerfed it. Garden Variety Vagabond sends in a tip and says, John and Rob, concerning the Top Gun box office this weekend, we have to take into account that it has definitely been considered the quintessential Father's Day movie. I've heard so many talking about sons bringing their middle-aged fathers to it. Garden Variety Vagabond, that is absolutely correct. Um, I think it was a huge Father's Day movie. And don't forget... Uh, today is a national holiday in the United States. It's Juneteenth. Juneteenth, actually, June 19th actually happened yesterday, but this day is considered a national holiday. Juneteenth is a national holiday. I believe no mail is delivered today, but don't quote me on that. Um, but it is a national holiday, and, and I think there's going to be a lot of box office being done today, but you're absolutely right. Father's Day, what be is there a better Father's Day movie than Top Gun Maverick? I mean, I guess you could say Field of Dreams might have been a better Father's Day movie. But in terms of in terms of fathers and sons going, fuck yeah, this movie, Top Gun Maverick, is is that's the fuck yeah Father's Day movie of all time, I would say. So absolutely, 100%. How awesome is this film? I mean, my dad's not around, but if he was, he would have loved Top Gun Maverick. So there you go. And that, my friends, kind, gentle viewers, is the end of today's mailbag. First of all, let me thank all of you from the bottom of all of our hearts here at the John Campy Show. Thank you for the generous support uh, by sending in these tips and these great questions. You support the channel, and it gives us something great to talk about and to discuss and to ruminate over. And obviously, if I have more things to ruminate over that I can throw over to Ray Ora's department right over there it's always a good thing again special thanks to ray ora for laughing at my jokes and i want to thank of course producer jonathan voico for doing a masterful job at producing these mailbags but mostly to you our loyal viewers once again thank you for supporting this channel my name is robert meyer burnett you can find me here on a daily basis you can find me on twitter at burnett rm find uh, gatekeeping and you can find me on instagram at rm burnett where i don't gatekeep i just put up lots of wa wacky photos so follow me there or you can find me on postgeeksingularity.com my website or postgeeksingularity the facebook page I will see you tomorrow or on the next mailbag. And thanks very much.